Awesome. So hi, everybody. I'm Brenda. I'm with Teller. Um, and we're an Oracle on Ethereum. But before that, I used to produce and publish economic statistics for the US government, um, like the producer price index and employment numbers, things like that. And I used to do also a lot of the methodology research behind it. So it's basically like defining you know, how we come up with those numbers and how we make sure that these numbers actually reflect the US economy. And that way, you know, we can put out all the information so people can determine whether or not they can use those numbers to make decisions. Now with Teller, I basically do just one portion of it. We just publish the data on chain. We're an Oracle. And what I've noticed a lot is that with so many backgrounds coming together onto blockchain and building all of this new industry, um, there's a very old problem that's becoming a new problem in new technology. And that's basically how you define what data to need, you need and how you basically settle different types of derivatives or beds, however you guys want to call them. Um, and that's what this talk is about. It's basically like going back and looking at how you should look at your oracles versus how you should also determine and define your data. Um, and, um, sorry, I have some notes. But the blockchain, how many of you guys are developers? Okay, so I have a good chunk of devs. Um, how many of you guys uh, have been in the space for a while? Hi. So everybody knows how blockchains work, right? So they work exactly like Vegas, right? Have any of you guys been to Vegas? No, Jesus. Okay, one. Perfect. Have you ever heard the, the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Yeah? Okay. So for those of you, um, what that basically means is that whatever happens in Vegas, it's a pact. Nobody knows about it except that environment. And blockchains work very similarly. Um, basically, what happens in the blockchain stays on the blockchain. Unless, you know, you get a millennial that goes to Vegas and posts everything on YouTube. And that's basically what oracles are. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's what we do. We just make sure that what happens in one space gets it's known in another space. We expand communication. We expand use cases within the blockchain. We make use cases a lot more interesting than just what's going on on chain. And that's basically why we exist. Um, and with that, I'm going to go through a very quick example of like how we are used. And we are used for much more, I think, eventually. We will be for more than just bets. But for right now, let's just go through this example. Let's assume that this uh, smart contract is very secure, gone through its audit, and then Alice and Bob are going to bet whether or not the price of Bitcoin is going to be above or below 30K. When I did this slide, uh, Alice won. <laughs> uh, I don't know about today. Uh, I haven't checked the price. But um, basically, what you need is a price feed. So Oracle and a data source, right? And if it all goes well, the right price gets in and everything goes perfect. But there are two very distinct attack vectors here when it comes to the data, putting data on chain. One is how the Oracle reaches consensus and how they make sure that your data is secure and not manipulated within the Oracle and how it reaches consensus. And then there's a second portion of it, which is actually what data they actually put in there and where they get it from. And that, I was saying like in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I used to do more of a, I created, I do some research, but then I also published it. Right now, oracles only publish your data. As a user, you are way, you know, you know better than nobody or anybody what you need for your contract to settle for your contract needs in terms of data. So oracles, you actually tell them, hey, go get this data and where to get it. So it's super important that you actually um, go and define it. Um, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about how, when you're defining your data, we're going to get there. Um, you also need to choose your Oracle and make sure that it is secure. Oracles, just like blockchains, have the same challenges. The scalability trilemma does not disappear for us. We're not going to be faster than the blockchain. If you need something to settle within seconds and you're on Ethereum, you're, you should probably use another blockchain. <laughs> That's not going to work. Um, when oracles 
reach consensus on layer one, there is no way that they're going to be faster than that. So for starters, look at that. And you're also going to have to make a determination where your Pareto equilibrium lies between your security and decentralization that you want versus how fast you want it. And that you're going to have to look into your Oracle and then the data source that you're going to be using. But that still applies to Oracles. Um, and in terms of Oracles, you're going to have basically these type of flavors. We have all sorts of different designs, but you're going to go from centralized to decentralized. Centralized is the easiest Oracle you can use. It's great for MVPs. It's great for, for something that you just need to get out the door um, on Hackathon or something like along those lines. The biggest name in that is currently it's provable. Before, they used to be Oracleized, and they're very easy to use, NPM install, and great, you know? But they're also very centralized, and the biggest downfall of that is that it is way easier to manipulate a centralized source than it is a decentralized source. But for an MVP, it's great. It gets you up and running, and then, you know, you're off to something. Um, then you have, like, a multi-sig uh, design where you can have, like, multiple parties actually submit data to your contract, and, you know, that kind of decentralizes a little bit more. Uh, then you have the multi-sig with our single relayer, which actually makes it a little bit more centralized because now all of them are just submitting one uh, signs of transaction on, on chain. Um, and then, you know, that kind of centralizes the, um, the structure of it. Um, then you have whitelisters. Um, and I have like POA and DPoS because you could kind of sort of relate oracles to how blockchains work. But anyway, your whitelister is basically somebody says, you know, these uh, addresses can actually submit data and you have to go through them to make sure that they can on your, um, on your protocol. And then there you have a decentralized protocol. It's going to be probably a lot slower, but it should be open. And one way that you can determine like whether or not, I, mean, I think one easy way that you can really determine something is decentralized or not, is if the team was to go away, either walk away and go to Bahamas, or just die tomorrow, um, will I still get data on my contract? Will that be, you know, will I still be able to get that data feed? And if you can honestly say yes, like awesome, then that is decentralized. None of us are thinking like what happens with, I mean, I hope that they're safe, uh, Lumen and Vitalik, right? But honestly, if they go away, if they walk away, we can all still use Ethereum. Nothing stops. You know, we don't call them for support. <laughs> it's like, hey, I can't get this. No, like that doesn't happen. That's decentralized. So the same type of test applies to oracles. Um, <laughs> with that, going back to the data source. So now that you know you're experts on oracles and how to sort of gauge where, where they fall within this centralization and decentralization range, you, are, you have to go back and look into your protocol and what do you need for it. Because you, you're telling, you're the boss. You're telling the oracles what to go get for you. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do, to be honest. It's something that even the Bureau, the majority of them, probably the budget, goes to research. Like, how do we make this data, based on whatever data we have available, how can we uh, you know, approximate the population in the best way possible? Because you're using a model. I mean, you're, you're just trying to get their in the best, most efficient way, but that is a very hard way, thing to do. When we are talking about the, um, so that in itself is the non-Oracle problem of bringing data on chain. And that falls on us, on the users, to determine what they need. Um, but some of the things that you should keep always in mind is how appropriate your data is. You know, is this really what I need? And that is, is going to go vary from case to case, whether you're doing a derivatives protocol or you're doing a, um, um, what is that, insurance sort of protocol. If you're doing, you know, that might be slower, faster. Um, how easy is it to manipulate the data sources that you're providing? Or how easy is it for them to disappear? If you're paying, if you're asking for a paid service, how easy is it to, for that API to go away? Um, if you're just asking for one specific API, how hard is it to DDoS it? Like, you're never going to get the data. I mean, I mean, it's pretty cheap, I think. Um, and availability, like how fast is that API? Is it really as sensitive as you need it to be? Because if you're asking for, 
you know, milliseconds fast data, um, and your source is not that fast, it's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen. The Oracle's not going to be able to get it. They're not going to be able to reach consensus as fast as you need it to. And that, those are just at least the beginning of things that you should look at before you even start thinking like, OK, how am I going to make sure that somebody doesn't come into my protocol and use this as a vector, as a vector attack because it is cheaper to do this than to actually pay out their bet. Um, and with that, some of the things that you can do, at least for pricing information, um, is you know, take a median across venues. Like make sure you use more than one source. That is the biggest thing. Do not use one source only. That is the easiest way to attack your network. And you're only as decentralized as your least decentralized vector in within your protocol. If you look at it and be honest with yourself, you're like, this is a major risk, ma major point of attack. That's when you have to go back to, how can I make this better? Volume weighted, I mean, volume weighted and time weighted, those two things, they take time. So just like we talk about Ethereum and Bitcoin, like how much would it cost to attack them for an hour? It gets more expensive. So if you do this, it, a, a, an attack on your actual data source, it's going to be harder and way more expensive. So even that just helps you already. Um, another thing that you can do, which is a little bit less conventional, um, at least in the space right now, is just... Providing a data, you know, I just want the price of Bitcoin. If you don't have to be from one specific source, it could be, that opens it up to being like, that price can come from a peer-to-peer -peer network, it can come from anywhere, and you will still get a price feed. It just makes it more open. Now, that, you know, you have to determine what you need and how exact you need to be. But if you want the price of Bitcoin from Coinbase API at 8 a.m., that's going to be very easy to attack. And if that's the only way you can settle your contract, you better have a, you know, like a backup way of how to actually con um, settle it if it doesn't get there. If you get negative data, zeros, you know, whatever. Um, and then another thing that, you know, it's mitigate the risk for edge cases. And that really has to go back to your own design of your protocol. Um, for Teller, we do, we do two types of tests. We do for, you know, once you do your smart contracts, you do function text, test, you know, functions work, requires works. And then we have to, we go back and actually think about like, okay, how are our, our users do this? You know, how, how, how are they going to break this? Because you know that, that user that is like, you swear it's this intuitive, it's so intuitive, a baby could do it, but then you have that one user that goes and uses it and like, oh man, I don't know how they broke it. But you have to go back, sit down, and we call them end-to-end -end tests. And we just try and figure out how our people are going to break our contract. And, you know, in terms of security, I was talking to a security person yesterday. And they're like, well, you know, what you really need to do is sit down and think, like, how would I attack my own contract? How would I take advantage of it? And then, once you're done with those tests or you, with those scenarios, then you can actually, you know, you're never going to completely uh, get rid of risk. I mean, it's code. Bottom line, there's no code without bugs, I mean, I think. You know, that's what we have. Now we have upgradable contracts. We have ways to go about it. But anyway, you go back, you determine what these cases would be. And that would help you also, like, determine your data source, determine your structure, and making sure that your users are actually uh, safe. And once you determine this, you have a whole definition that you can actually give to your Oracle because they, when they reach consensus, the way that they're going to know whether or not they provided you the right data is going to be based on that definition. And anything that, we like, for example, if, they, if they're slashing or, or like if, if, if the numbers can be disputed because they were bad numbers or whatever, um, they need to know what to reference. And they're going to reference that definition and that data source to actually be able to come up with uh, a consensus on it. So. Um, in terms of what to do, um, um, I think it's, it's for a protocol. Before I was in Teller, our very first startup was actually derivatives. And we use more than one source of data because, you know, sometimes an API is down, sometimes uh, the actual resource is down. And because of that, we realized that, like, in production especially, like, that happens on mainnet, and that gives you a lot of headaches. Like, that cannot happen when you're securing millions of dollars on your protocol. So you have to have backup.
plans. And I think one of the easiest ways to do this is to just use several oracles. There's an, um, an EIP proposed already for that. Um, to use some sort of standard so that you can switch back and forth between oracles or just add more. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is super useful because for somebody to actually dive into the architecture of two different oracles that were completely different, it's going to be one, really hard technically, and then two, it's going to make it super expensive for them to actually break two if you're using the median of three, let's say, um, than it is to break one. Like if they find a vulnerability in one, then they can actually attack your protocol if, it's, uh, if, if the cost of doing that is actually lower than what they aim to lose or gain, right? Um, and then also, um, always, you know, what can you do within your protocol structure if you get bad data, if you get a zero, if you get negative numbers, what happens? Because APIs are APIs, you don't control them. If they're testing something, if they're testing an upgrade, they're upgrading their API, now it's gonna have extra zeros, and all of a sudden you have a flash crash that didn't exist or a flash you know, increase that like it, it didn't happen, but it was just the API you know, was bad. And it's still gonna be a valid query because you told the Oracle to go get this data from that API. So it's still valid, that's what it said, but it's not what is expected and it's not correct. Um, and you just want to make sure that you have some sort of levers to like f manage that. You know, you never, like I said, risk is there. Um, but you can do a delay, you can do a freeze, you can, once you do a freeze, you can go through a vote and, and, and make sure that you get your protocol back up and running and it doesn't just get pulled down like because of some very, very quick attack. Um, and then, because once you have your data defined, you can actually go back to your oracles, like, is it fast enough? You know, how, how much does it cost to break it? Um, can it really secure what I have on my protocol? And, um, you know, then you have to, like, the liveness, which is just basically, like, will it still survive and will I still get my data, whether or not the team is there? Um, but those things you determine, like, once you have your data, like, then you and define, then you can say, like, this, this oracles fit this model or are similar to what I need, they can actually sustain it. Then, you know, you, you go back to that, to the drawing board. And, and that's, that's pretty much it. Like, choose the right ar architecture, use more than one Oracle, use more than one data source, decentralize your architecture in terms of how you get the data, and minimize the, the attack vector to it. And just protect your, your, your users. Right now, the block, there's, the entire space, it's a tiny industry compared to like those cemented industries that are already out there. The financial sector is huge compared to, to what we have right now. And the last thing we want is to have regulators come down on us because we don't, or because they perceive that we're just trying to defraud people when we're just trying to do something better. And if we can just or keep our users safe, I think that'll keep regulators away from us, at least for a little bit, until we can grow the industry into actually being something that can be here for a long time. Um, and that's it for my presentation. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Do I have Any questions? Hi, thanks Hi. Uh, for the talk. Um, you mentioned something about the Oracle standard uh, that was kind of being discussed. Could you expand on that? Yes. Um, basically, we the, it's um, it's called the the ADO, as Alliance of Decentralized Oracles, and we formed it about two years ago or about a year and a half ago. It's been a while. We just uh, keep going in and out of it, but like we're basically just trying to come up with a standard where we all provide or submit or output data in a very similar way so that the users can just basically go from one to another. Um, right now, I think we have settled on byte data and it's 2372. Do you guys remember the number? No? Anyway, um, it's, it's, it is on the um, Ethereum Git, um, 
Gitcoin, uh, GitHub. Uh, we already submitted it. Uh, we're still working on it. I think we dropped the first one. We went back to the drawing board. We're back at it now, and that's basically because as the industry w grows and the amount of money that is being secured grows, we, we understand that there is a need for people to just have options. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Have you looked into more privacy preserving or other data? Everything here is public data, which many people can access, like mm -hmm. price feeds and stuff. What about any private, like I know, uh, data f about a person or something else, which is which is not available as much? Have you thought about like privacy preserving type oracles or on private data? I mean, um, I think everybody is working on the privacy. It's very expensive to do anything private on the on chain. Um, we haven't really gone into that because I think a lot of the things that we do, especially for, and because we were so focused on price data, uh, we wanted to be as <coughs> transparent. But yes, I have. I'm, I'm actually like thinking yes. about the, the privacy of the data, mm -hmm. which then can be analyzed by an oracle and then published. Whatever. This typical example of KYC is uh -huh. this user a legit person, and you don't want to put this on chain. Right. So oracles could do something, but then because it's not public, you need right. to share it with multiple oracles. Like th that's I think the the challenge I see that if we have anything mm. which is about a p people itself or mm -hmm. information which is not published to the world, how can we bridge this gap from private data to some attestation on chain? I think it would at least for us like the attestation. It, it happens on chain when you can. It could be I think. Encrypted, right? But if like three, like right now, the way that we reach consensus is three out of five, um, and it could be a way, like if at least three out of five or three of whatever submit the same encrypted data, then you could assume that it is correct. I don't know, but we have not really looked into privacy data to, or, or, or of the data and bridging that at this point. So, if anybody has any ideas, you know, happy to talk about it or, sure. yeah. Uh, sorry, this is, might be, sound like a question too much up in the clouds, but uh, how do you think that AI will affect um, oracles and maybe up in the stratosphere, how do you think that AI could actually uh, help decentralize data retrieving in a, in a consensus-based way? Um, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of the... And I'm, I can only speak for Teller because I know that other oracles work differently. But what you do to collect the data c outside of uh, when you actually reach consensus on chain, you c I mean, you could do all sorts of aggregations and run a lot more. Like you could even do AI, like trying to figure out other things. But as long as when you get it on chain, there is a consensus of w how you got to that truth. I think you could use pretty much anything you want, even if it was AI to like depending on what models you're trying to determine or whatever. But what really matters is on-chain. How are they reaching consensus and how you're making sure that they, that um, the reporters are providing valid data. And if you can somehow reach, you know, if, like I said, like if it's three of, out of five submitting the same hash, and then there's like two random ones that you're like, well, where did they come up with this? But it's difficult. It depends what it is. It, it can be difficult because, uh, you know, if it's a string, it's going to be very difficult. If it's a number, it's probably going to be you know, the same hash. It's like 10 is going to be the hash of 10. Uh, but if it's a string, it's going to be more complex, and that's something that you have to define. And that's something that within the reporter, so when you uh, ask for the data, you have to define like how you're going to decode it, what, what it means. Um, so, but outside of, of the on-chain portion, I think off-chain, you can use anything you want. I mean as long as you can bring it to, cons to consensus on chain. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think, um, just remember what happens in Paris. <laughs> we'll, probably n we'll probably end up in Twitter, actually, in this conference. So anyway, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.